Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Scrabel, and I'm the director of Chicago Studies and Experiential Learning in the college at the University of Chicago. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's presentation, The City of the Third Coast. Today's presentation is the fourth in a series of distinguished lectures, community conversations, and other events that seek to reimagine the future of Chicago after an incredibly difficult period in our cities and our nation's history. The series, which we've entitled Chicago Futures, has been developed as a collaboration between two offices within the undergraduate college at the university. Chicago Studies offers curricular and co-curricular opportunities for the college community to study, engage with, and positively impact the diverse communities of our world-class city. The Parasia Program for Public Discourse offers courses and programming that aim to develop communicative competence and foster vigorous, inclusive, and productive public discourse within a wide variety of communities. To date, our series has included three distinguished lectures and three community conversations with representatives of local industries significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. All of these have been recorded, if you're just joining us now, and are available on the Chicago Studies website, which is chicagostudies.uchicago.edu. In spring, our series will continue with four more distinguished lectures, plus additional conversations on the future of Chicago small businesses, farmers markets, and music scene. We hope that you're able to join us for all of these. The Chicago Futures series as a whole has been generously co-sponsored by the Office of the President here at the University of Chicago. Today's session is also co-sponsored by the Program on the Global Environment. And now it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce the first of our dialogue partners this evening. Neil Brenner is Lucy Flower Professor of Urban Sociology at the University of Chicago and a recent addition to the faculty. Neil is a critical urban theorist, sociologist, and geographer who's interested in all aspects of research on cities and urbanization. His writing and teaching focus on the challenges of reinventing our approach to urbanization in relation to the crises, contradictions, and struggles of our time. Brenner has made influential contributions to scholarly debates on critical urban theory, the critique of capitalist urbanization, urban restructuring, state space, the political economy of rescaling, variegated neoliberalization, and planetary urbanization. Neil completed his PhD in political science here at the University of Chicago in the late 90s and previously taught sociology and metropolitan studies at NYU, then urban theory at Harvard's Graduate School of Design before joining the sociology faculty this past fall. At U Chicago, he teaches classes on urban social science, especially in relation to contemporary urban transformations and environmental emergencies. Again, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Neil Brenner. Neil? So I think you can hear me, but my video is not starting and I'm trying to start. So forgive me everyone for this glitch. There we go. Can everyone see me now? Okay, perfect. Sorry for that, everyone. So greetings, um, colleagues, friends, students. Thank you very much, Chris, for that introduction. Welcome everyone to today's session of the Chicago Futures Distinguished Lecture Series in the Chicago Studies Program here at the University of Chicago. Um, again, welcome everyone. I see many students in the room, including from my own class, City Space and Power. So I'm delighted to see all of you here and we look forward to um, the discussion. Um, I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to contribute to the series and to welcome my colleague, Professor Claire Lester of UIC to animate our imagination of contemporary Chicago and its regional and indeed super regional context. Claire Le Leister is an architect and writer whose work focuses on urban design from the perspective of contemporary theories in landscape, urbanization, and infrastructure. Her creative practice explores the design of the built environment from the perspective of systems and flows ranging from the adaptive reuse of 19th and 20th century urban infrastructure 
to an investigation of the territorial implications of emerging socio-technical networks. Claire holds a BARC from the University College Dublin and an MARC from Yale, and she now serves as associate professor here in Chicago at UIC's School of Architecture. Architecture. Claire is the author of a number of books, including this one, Learning from Logistics, How Networks Change Cities, which was published in 2016 by Bierkoiser. And the theme of today's discussion, you can see this is quite a tome, The Third Coast Atlas, A Prelude to a Plan, co-edited with two colleagues of mine, um, Daniel Ibanez and Charles Waldheim of Harvard, as well as Mason White of University of Toronto, a beautiful and wonderful book that we're gonna dive deeply into very shortly, but I just wanted to share with you the actual physical artifacts that's, since, it, since it's so um, really remarkable, um, both in size and in content. Um, Claire's writing has also appeared in major journals of architecture and design, as well as in widely circulated anthologies. She's a principal of CLUAA, a research-based design practice located at the intersection of architecture, landscape, and urbanism, which speculates on the future of the city through writing and design. Um, the uh, office's work has been exhibited locally and internationally, including at the Art Institute of Chicago, University College Dublin, and at the Lisbon Architecture Triennale. She's a member of Annex, the curatorial team selected for the Irish Pavilion at the upcoming Venice Biennale, and she's also co-editor of a publication related to that exhibition. Claire's work articulates architectural and design discourse and methods far beyond the traditional scale of the building and the urban design site to consider much broader multi-scalar questions about urbanization, territory, and environmental transformation in the Chicago region and beyond. And that's exactly how I'd like to frame tonight's, um, this afternoon's discussion in relation to two rather significant issues that I think will be of great interest to um, everyone in the room and are really of great urgency to all of us. One um, is basically just the issue of thinking about the many scales on which urbanization occurs. This is obviously Chicago studies were necessarily focused on Chicago as a site and scale of urbanization. Claire's work, both in general and specifically in Third Coast Atlas, opens up many other scales of urban life, of urban transformation, of planning and struggle and crisis which we arguably need to deal with. So I think that's a fundamental agenda for all of us who are working in this space. And just as importantly, I just wanna flag, it's clear from the bio, from my introduction of Claire's work thus far, she's deeply embedded in the design disciplines, but her work connects up the design disciplines to many other traditions of scholarship and research in the social sciences and in the environmental sciences. Um, so alongside our theme for the day, Claire's presentation up here gives us the opportunity to discuss Claire's particular positionality within the design disciplines and the ways in which heterodox approaches to architecture and urban design can contribute to our understanding and to our ability to shape emergent urban transformations, again, both in Chicago and beyond. So our focus tonight is Third Coast Atlas, published by Octar a couple of years ago. It's sold out but maybe you can find a copy someplace, somehow. I highly recommend it. Um, and the subtitle of this book, Prelude to a Plan, is also something that I think we'll have opportunity to discuss um, as we proceed. Um, it's a very interesting and provocative subtitle. It suggests very clearly the need for research as an anticipation to future interventions, the nature of which needs to be further def defined and debated about. So the format will be um, as follows. Claire Leister will present um, some ideas from this book and beyond for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for discussion. I'll offer a few comments in immediate response, and then we'll open up the chat box and you can simply submit your questions um, in writing and I'll curate the questions and we'll have a bit of a discussion and a kind of jam session about the issues that are raised. So again, thank you to all, everyone for being here. Um, and uh, thank you so much to Claire for um, joining us. Um, over to you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, and um, welcome to Chicago. Neil and I do go back through um, our sort of communal friends 
um, at the GSD. And as Neil said, my co-editors on the book, uh, Charles and Danny, um, are sort of um, GSD faculty. And then Mason White, uh, an alum of the GSD, now teaching at the University of Toronto and who is um, a really great friend and colleague of mine. Um, so I'm going to share the screen and just somebody might give me a, a thumbs up to see that's super, that's okay. So I'm just gonna slide all these little chat boxes and such out of my way. So um, that was a very nice introduction um, to the book. Um, and just thanks Chris and Felix and Tess for your, and Joe for sort of getting all of this together. Very impressive. Um, as Neil said, um, the book is three years old now, um, but the book was always more than just an object or a sort of, a, you know, a book is a form of scholarship that you do and then it ends and you move on. For us, the book was more about developing a network of thought behind the topic of the Great Lakes. And so in that way, the book is still very organic in terms of the ideas and the energy and the discussion that it aims to promote. Um, the second thing is that in a very Midwestern patriotism, the book was really um, also an idea to foreground the Midwest and to foreground the Midwest in discussions of urbanism um, that tend to sort of get swallowed up by the, the, the coasts. Um, and interestingly enough, the Midwest, if you unfold the coastline, is actually longer than the Atlantic and the Pacific coastlines combined. So in theory, we should really be calling ourselves the first coast, not the third coast. Um, and so it was kind of in that vein that the history, not just the urban history of the region, but the hydrological history of the region, um, the economic history of the region, all combined um, seem to suggest that um, the region offers up um, a very good framework through which we can talk about processes of urbanization and what it means to be a city or a region. And so are we advancing there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so there's the, the proof of the diagram that I just um, um, talked about. The other thing too that's important that Neil brought up is um, the subtext, the prelude to a plan. And so, um, you know, as a, as a designer, as an urban scholar, you know, the first question is, how do you, how do you think about planning at the scale of a region? What do you need in place to sort of be able to think holistically or synthetically at the scale of a region that is the third coast? Um, and so the, the book is very much conceived to us as a design manual, or as the title suggests, an atlas. Now, the students might be kind of confused. Why are urban arts and architects calling their book about a region, an architecture and urban book, an atlas? Because an atlas is something like a geographer does. Um, but the atlas word comes up purely out of this sort of notion of synthetic research, the meaning that you could really only fully understand or document the region if you look at it from a multiple different angles, if you look at it from multiple different perspectives. And it's the overlay of those perspectives um, and thinking about conflicts and anomalies between those perspectives that one really produces a kind of framework for understanding the region. And so the book, um, uh, you know, at the beginning, the book attempts to describe the sort of geophysical characteristics of the region, which, I mean, I'm, I'm actually recognizing that we might have some international students here and so might not actually be familiar with the area. Um, the Great Lakes, of course, is a um, comprised of five um, uh, lakes, um, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario that are then interconnected. So there are five separate lakes, but they actually operate as one hydrological region. Um, and then the, the lakes are sort of augmented by a series of different artificial waterways 
um, such as the Erie Canal, which we'll talk about a little later, um, that sort of actually gave greater significance to the water body because as we know, the Erie Canal was the waterway that linked the Great Lakes to the Atlantic seaboard and, and really was responsible for the opening up of the whole interior of the Americas. And so immediately we see the, the kind of significance of the region over and beyond itself. And that sort of lends itself too into Chicago. If you're thinking about a city or talking about a city, where does the city begin and end? How do you know what you can find your scholarship to, especially in the contemporary area where now our metropolitan Chicago is extending to 9 million people and is really Northeast Illinois into Southern Wisconsin, into Indiana, that the notion of the city has sort of burst its boundaries beyond what we might have originally thought of as an urban edge. Um, and so that gets to the kind of larger interplay between region and city, Great Lakes and Chicago. And that's something that we talk about, not just only in reference to Chicago in the book, but also to the other major cities that call the Great Lakes home. Toronto, Milwaukee, Detroit, Toledo, Buffalo, New York, the kind of major metropoli of the industrial era in the Western world. So the book, I'm just going to quickly kind of just go through the book. Um, again, just reinforcing this, um, the multi perspectives. Um, the book is subdivided into a variety of sections. They're all called P. Um, this is the first one called Projections, um, which aims again just to really describe the territory, the geophysical um, territory. And of course, as we know, the, the Great Lakes are a relatively new landscape. Um, the result maybe 10 to 12,000 years ago with the retreating of the, the glaciers, um, leaving the kind of bathymetry of the region that we know today. And so the beginning of the book really tries to describe that territory through a series of drawings. And so in, in sort of aligned with these different perspectives um, is also a series of graphic um, um, techniques that describe the territory. So the first one is, is a traditional mapping, um, both in section, in plan, and through maps of the different lakes. And so you can see here the, the variation in the depth. Um, on the left is Lake Superior, which of course is the deepest, largest lake, um, working eastwards to Lake Erie, which is the shallowest lake, um, to the um, Ontario, and then of course to the St. Lawrence Seaway. So again, a kind of mapping project is the kind of first thing that we kind of began. Also too, looking at the image, particularly on the right there, is showing the kind of the satellite, the planetary diagram of the region um, from the perspective of the different urban areas. And so you can see predominantly urbanization existing on the lower southern part of the lakes. And of course, you can see the kind of large footprint of Chicago. Um, you can read Detroit, you can read Cleveland, and then extending further east, you can pick out Rochester, New York, Buffalo, Ottawa, and Toronto slightly to the north. The image on the left, of course, is the kind of iconic shape of the region and um, sort of admitting the quantity of fresh water, if the world's fresh water exists in this, um, the basin area. And what the Great Lakes Basin just really means is a line is the watershed of the Great Lakes, uh, which is sort of outside of the actual water body. And that just means that anything in that shed line drains into the Great Lakes, anything outside that shed line drains to the Mississippi. So it's, it's kind of um, a, a kind of very large continental um, line um, in the sort of geology of the country. Um, then looking at sort of urbanization again, and then looking on the image on the left is commercial traffic. Of course, one of the main 
uh, catalysts for urbanization of the region was in fact the lakes as a form of transportation. And so that um, natural resources that existed in the upper Midwest and in Canada, or whether it was lumber in northern Michigan um, or in northern Wisconsin, the lakes became this conduit um, linking different resources to different cities. Um, and of course, then that sort of becomes amplified with these canals that start to link different water bodies together um, in the urbanization area as we move um, eastwards. Um, also in this section, just looking at, um, we, we featured the 12, what we consider the major metropoli of the region, and just do a sort of little diagram of the black dot in these diagrams is urban, like the political urban boundary population, and then the gray orbit or ring outside the black is the metropolitan population. And so what you can start to see um, is over time how metropolitan areas have increased and um, downtown core populations have started to decrease. So the map, the, the book becomes a map of population and urban statistics um, of uh, the cities in the area um, since their inception um, in the kind of mid, early 19th century. And so that brings me to the second sort of section of the book, which is called Prospects, which does just that, focuses a little more on these major um, metropolitan regions. Um, and so what we did is we solicited um, 12 essays on these different 12 cities that I just mentioned um, from urban planners, um, uh, designers, uh, journalists. Um, this is Jerry Heron's text on Detroit, which really is a summary of a series of essays he put out in places in maybe the mid teens um, that sort of charts a, a story of Detroit. And the image on the right there you can see is a kind of map, a different kind of map, kind of an infographic that starts to show the kind of population increase in population and what you'll see mostly population peaks between the 1930s and the 1950s, the demise of urban population in favor of metropolitan population, and then some iconic urban design moments or iconic cultural moments in the history of that particular city. Um, Richard Summer, who is the um, Dean of the Architecture School at University of Toronto, um, wrote an essay about Toronto. And of course, interesting now that Toronto is now the third city in North America. The other interesting thing about the Great Lakes is because it's a binational region, um, you start to think about the region beyond the nation state. Um, and we sort of start to talk about North America without being specific to Canada or to the US. Um, Chicago, Bob Brookman, um, my colleague, um, now ex-Bob is retired from uh, urban historian at University of Illinois Chicago, um, wrote, writes the essay about Chicago. Um, Katerina Rudy Ray writes about Toledo um, and so on. So all the essays or the, the urban essays are really like a report from the field of that particular city or the state that that particular city is in at the moment. And it's not all good news. Um, this book is not like, is, is, is quite depressing in parts. Um, it doesn't hold back many of the social, economic, and now recently ecological challenges that we face collectively as both scholars and designers. Um, a portfolio section in the book, I've kind of combined two sections here just for the purpose of, of the discussion. Um, looking again at the kind of history of map making of the region, whether it was from the French through like the early fur traders that kind of, you know, sort of navigated the territory as they encountered the territory, um, then to the more kind of colonial maps um, by the French and then the British, um, and then leading up to um, the kind of first Army Corps of Engineers survey 
of the territory um, in the kind of 1870s. I want to say these maps are from 1872, but um, don't quote me on that. Um, but what's fascinating about these maps is that they were sort of extremely precise deployed the kind of latest mapping technologies of their day in terms of triangulating points, um, referencing every sort of little corrugation of the coastline to lines of latitude and longitude. So a very kind of scientific way of understanding the territory. The potentials section in the book is a far more kind of contemporary way of describing the territory. And we invited a series of architects, landscape architects and urbanists, some from the GSD, some from Midwestern institutions like University of Michigan, um, uh, University of Madison at Milwaukee, um, from IIT. Um, and they were written a series of um, sort of design research essays um, called potentials. And basically they just take different approach the region through different concepts. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple of these um, um, just to kind of give you the range of the approaches. This is Pierre Boulanger's, of course, another colleague um, of, of Neil's. Um, Pierre is a Canadian landscape architect um, from University of Toronto and then more recently at the GSD. Um, Pierre writes about the notion, like what is a region or what is, how do you kind of characterize the notion of regionalization, even before you start to approach it as a kind of scholarly topic. And so he talks about the kind of the, the region in three different eras in the kind of early industrial, um, the kind of fantastic, heroic, you know, um, changing the flow of the Chicago River and all the kind of big infrastructure building projects in the kind of heyday of the region and the kind of um, the sort of uh, building of the region as this monumental place in the public imagination. And then goes on into the sort of post-war era when the kind of the rise of the suburbs in the region um, and the beginning of the demise of the kind of inner city predominantly told through the kind of Detroit story. Um, and then more recently from the 1970s onwards, he starts to profile a series of landscapes in the Great Lakes from the perspective of the environmental crisis. And in fact, many of the early environmental projects um, stem from the Midwest in the 1970s, whether it was the the, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, who infamously went on fire, I don't know how many times in its history, to the Love Canal issue, um, to um, other sites um, in Toronto that were really, really early post-industrial super fun sites. And so the idea that maybe the, the kind of the post-industrial landscape emerged from the Midwest or that way of thinking about space. Um, and so just some images. Um, another um, essay looks at um, sort of um, dredging in the Great Lakes and the kind of the movement of um, silt um, throughout the kind of in, in tandem with the flow of water and how that silt causes enormous problems when it builds up in different areas, particularly where rivers meet on the lakes. Um, in particular, Toledo, the Mami River in Toledo um, is this huge, big um, problem. You can see it there, the big, the big orange dot where huge silt builds up and then the necessity for huge dredging infrastructure projects um, to sort of appease that problem. A similar um, um, a way of thinking about dredging in the Great Lakes, and these are more landscape architecture projects by Sean Burkholder, who you'll probably all know is now at Penn working on this fantastic project with the Great Lakes um, Fund um, on dredging in the Great Lakes. Um, and he explores where all the dredged silt, where does that go once it's all kind of collected together? It goes to these confined disposal facilities of which I think there's like 80 in the Midwest and most of them are full or are capped. And so in a way they're adding 
to the edge line of the Great Lakes because we're increasing the kind of the literal edge to use his terminology. Um, and then what are the kind of ideas for land use or programming um, of these new expanded landscapes as a result of dredging in the area. So very much situated in a kind of landscape architecture. Jeff Manon and Anna Demalski's living in the glacial afterlife, afterlife is really a history, like the history of the Great Lakes from the kind of 14,000 years ago, um, from the perspective of water, but looking at water at very different scales, like looking at water as a glacial system, um, to looking at water as an infrastructural system. They talk about the Erie Canal and the sort of artificial augmentation of the hydrology, to looking at sort of water at a microscopic level in terms of pharmaceutical industries that have located themselves in Wisconsin. So kind of where geology and economy of water sort of intersect. Um, just coming near the end of this category, um, Kathy Velikoff and Jeff Thune, who teach at the University of Michigan are architects, have a kind of another mapping project called Shed Cartographies. And they have a series of very beautiful maps of the region that starts to map, not necessarily geophysical characteristics, but starts to map economic issues, um, starts to map the major industries of the area of the era, um, like the medical industry in the Midwest, or looking at logistical systems, railways in the Midwest. Um, so looking at a kind of another industrial history of the area and presenting them in these very beautiful maps. Um, Jen McGray and Maria Arquero de Alcron, also from Michigan, look at um, water systems in Detroit. Um, Detroit, like many cities, have a combined sewer and rainwater system that causes enormous trouble. I mean, we kind of have a separated one in Chicago, um, but even when we have um, a lot of rainfall, we have to release um, um, the uh, water into the um, lakes and rivers. And so there's a problem with pollution. And so their project starts to look at Detroit now that Detroit is supposedly shrinking its infrastructure or that Detroit, because it's reduction in population and in services and finances, has to rethink how it um, funds and services the city. And so there's an idea about developing a much softer uh, way of thinking about sewage and water, water runoff that might also catalyze the city um, into kind of different, using ec ecological systems as a way to catalyze new forms of urbanization um, in the kind of vacant land that we associate with Detroit. Um, Moving on to another, there's just two more sections left in the book, profiles. The image on the right is a kind of land use diagram of the edge of the Great Lakes. And so you can see all of these colors um, and the logic that much of the edge of the Great Lakes isn't actually public. Um, and so how do you start to resolve private development um, with public access to the lakes moving forward. And so this section um, also, I suppose, cartography, Mason and I ran a seminar at the GSD, oh gosh, about eight years ago. And um, much of our work in that seminar was kind of reproduced here for the book. But we looked again, going back to these 12 cities that I talked about, um, looking at the kind of land use um, in those cities adjacent either the lake edge or adjacent another waterway that feeds into the lake. And so the image on the right is Chicago, which might be a more um, familiar land use diagram alongside the river and then of course the lake shore that we all know today. And then the image on the right being Toledo, Ohio, which I briefly mentioned before, which, you know, in one way Toledo is like more like a river city than it is a lake city. Um, but looking at the confluence of zoning 
with respect the river to the lake. And so then sort of extrapolating these land uses at these kind of smaller scale, almost more diagrammatic land use plans so that you can kind of very quickly in one view understand the zoning or the land use of a city with respect its relationship with the water. The last section of the book which comes at the end is a kind of um, index of um, well I would like to say every urban design project in the lakes since the year 2000. Um, and so you can see this kind of key in diagram um, where all the projects are taking place. We call this the good, bad and the ugly. Um, some of them are speculative projects and super designy. Some of them are developer projects and perhaps not as, as kind of wonderful as we might hope. Um, and then some are just kind of schematic diagrams um, for different cities. Um, but what's really interesting um, in this is um, you begin to see that even like the smallest, like, I mean, not that Duluth is not a small, but Thunder Bay, Ontario, um, you know, cities that are pretty peripheral cities, like Thunder Bay is, is, is remote. Um, but how these cities are recognizing that much of their dependency on the lakes is now changing because industrialization of the lakes um, is decreasing. And so all of these lake born cities and towns are readdressing their value of their waterfronts. And so again, these tiny towns um, thinking quite futuristically about what is the agency of their waterfront moving forward, not only to their own economy, but how do they understand their place in this larger region moving forward. And so just really amazing. Again, it's not looking at any one plan that this study is, is kind of critical, but it's just looking broad stroke across all these different areas and seeing um, how people are re-envisioning on um, the area. And that's kind of how we, we kind of end the book. Just gonna... And then um, the last kind of spread of the book is, um, is the contributors um, that again feeds back into, you know, one of the roles of the book was to develop a cohort of thinkers around the topic of the Great Lakes, um, a cohort that was kind of indigenous, more or less, to the region um, and promoting that scholarship um, in any way we could. Um, so that's the book. Um, I just wanted to um, then, in terms of my own work, so the book is like three years old, um, the book was also called Prelude to a Plan because maybe one would also then have a second volume that actually did the plan or a series of plans. I mean, there's no way that you would actually kind of think about making a singular plan or one big master plan for a region of this scale. Um, although it did play into the RPA's subdivision of the US into 10 mega regions um, and the Great Lakes mega region is one of those 10 regions, although the Great Lakes mega region is not isomorphic with the Great Lakes basin. The Great Lakes major region is actually a little bigger. It goes down to Cincinnati on the south, Pittsburgh on the east. Um, but there is a kind of logic to understanding the continental scale through these 10 mega regions. Um, and so, you know, for me, um, as a kind of interdisciplinary thinker where um you know i i have a design practice um i i draw um and i write um, and so it's always interesting for me to be able to apply the research and um, the kind of historical cultural research with a design project and so i'm just going to quickly go through one um, this will take about three or four minutes um, a couple of years ago um, governor cuomo was part of the new york state stimulus plan um, 
uh, promised to inject money into the Erie Canal. At that time, the Erie Canal um, was purchased um, by NIPA, which is the New York Power Authority. So they buy a canal, 365 miles long. Um, and because commercial navigation is now reduced on the canal, and so the canal is a kind of micro quasim of the region at large, which what makes it so interesting. Um, NIPA want to think about how can the canal sustain itself as a waterway moving forward now that commercial navigation um, is no longer um, sort of happening as much as it used to. This is an old picture of Rochester where the canal was actually on a viaduct to go across the Genesee River. Um, and so these are historical images of the Erie Canal. And so I got involved in the project thinking about um, the different canal towns on the Erie Canal. These are sort of all historic images. Here's a map of the locks of the Erie Canal, of which there's numerous as a way to kind of navigate um, the different topographies um, of the landscape between Erie Canal, of course, going from Albany, which is where it intersects with the Hudson River, all the way to Buffalo on the western side where it intersects with Lake Erie. Um, I'm not going to talk about that image. These are some sections of the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was originally built, started in 1825. So it was one of the first infrastructural projects in the US. Um, and then it was subsequently expanded upon in the subsequent like 100 years. In fact, very little of the original canal line still exists today. Anyway, to cut a long story short, my idea for the canal was, well, the canal runs pretty well between April and November in summertime. There's lots of activities in these canal towns. There's bike tours. Um, but what happens to the canal in wintertime? Um, and always having this kind of romantic notion of winter in a northern city that extends from perhaps living in Chicago. Um, and then this image um, of Rochester and of Syracuse, New York, um, of people ice skating on the canal in this kind of urban area. So the project was really about reclaiming a kind of winter landscape on the canal. And this is an image of the project. Um, of course, what happened was um, because of global warming and this kind of gets to kind of ecological discussion, um, the winters in upstate New York are not as cold as they used to be. And so the canal actually doesn't freeze that much anymore. So here we are doing a project about freezing the canal and the canal doesn't freeze. Um, and so um, that's why our project ends up being a kind of synthetic landscape. It's actually made from marine decking. Um, but because the Erie Canal is dewatered in wintertime, um, they shut down the, the, the guard gates and lower the water level in the canal so they can carry out some maintenance projects. It means that you could still actually embed this artificial landscape into the section of the canal and so when you're skating here on this sort of artificial surface you actually do think you're in the canal and um, here's a program diagram that starts to explore this deck surface from the perspective of ice water and fire whether it's ice related program water based program fire being campfire fireworks warming huts um, that you find in many of these upstate areas. And then the kind of typical architect, you know, the photomontage, but again, you can see how the surface of the uh, deck is submerged in the canal. So you can start to, the, the old stone embankment walls are legible. Um, and so tries to kind of reclaim or sort of um, render legible the kind of history of the waterway um, in, as, as a catalyst, not only to the region, but to the whole interior of the US. Here's a guy doing his kind of s'mores over the campfire. Um, some tech drawings that show how the, um, the deck is tethered to the base of the canal. 
some phasing diagrams that show how these the different kind of um, sections of this deck um, could come together or phased. And then, of course, the a deployment diagram, the um, the the deck is um, stored in a dry dock in summer and is floated down the canal um, just before the guard gates go down. So it's floated in place. The idea is that it would go to a different town every year. And so that you would sort of kind of like the Olympics, you know, that next, the, the towns would kind of bid for this facility as a way to kind of reignite their economies. Um, here's some more photo montages. Here it is potentially floating into other um, towns. Um, and then here's the kind of money shot. Um, this got into a phase two um, of the competition, but we didn't win. Here's the money shot showing it in Fairport, um, which is probably one of the most iconic and busiest canal towns, if anyone knows that area, um, about midway across the canal in New York State, um, showing it in location um, in, in the kind of town. And this is a view from one of the bridges across um, the canal in Fairport. And then I just wanted to end with these few images um, just to kind of, the, the, the story of the Great Lakes um, it continues and actually is very popular as a kind of area of scholarship and a source of debate, um, both within and outside the discipline. Um, so, for instance, Dan Egan's book that came out maybe I want to say two, three years ago after Third Coast, but not long, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes talks about a history of the Great Lakes from a kind of ecological perspective, talks about all the different kind of marine disasters, you know, when the kind of fishing um, um, ecosystem um, changed in the 1950s and, and the implications of that, the sea lampreys, the sea mussels and so on, to the introduction of Kohoiki salmon. Um, and then more recently, um, the image on the right was in Nat Geographic, maybe last year, um, a profile of the Great Lakes. Um, and so that's pretty international exposure. And then last year, the Chicago Tribune ran um, a series on the Great Lakes where they focus on a different lake each every month or so. It went from like maybe over the space of about seven or eight months where they profile um, Lake Erie and they take a couple of um, places on the lake or they profile some of the challenges um, in, in this case, the algae blooms in Lake Erie. If you look over Lake Erie in spring and summer, it's green, it's not blue. And that's because Lake Erie is incredibly shallow and the water temperature is warm. Um, and we get a lot of algae bloom in the coastal area because of agricultural runoff into the lake or industrial pollution in the lake. And it has nowhere to go. Um, and then, of course, that was a major problem for Cleveland a couple of years ago in terms of the quality of the drinking water. Um, more recently, as most of you are aware, if you spent any time here last summer, even if the lakefront was closed for much of the summer and um, because of the pandemic, you will be aware of the increasing water levels. Um, and both the economic and ecologic destruction that that's causing, particularly in southern Indiana and up the coast in Michigan. Um, a lot of people have their houses falling into the water because of the high water levels that are eating away at the dunes. Um, and so that's been a major issue, not just in Lake Michigan, but also in Huron over the last um, few years. And that's combined with a kind of natural cycle of high tide, which supposedly is in 30 year cycles in the region, combined with excessive runoff that we had from the two polar vortex winters in what was it, 2014, 2015. Um, so a, a combination, and then perhaps, you know, maybe larger, larger macro um, climate change um, transformations having um, a big. Um, causing big impact on the um, rising water level in the coastlines. 
Um, I don't know what the Lake Superior one was. I didn't read this one. Um, something about ice there. Um, Lake Ontario. Um, and then looking at Lake Michigan again, which again, I suppose, you know, the lake rising sea level, water level here problem given Michigan's, especially Western Michigan's reliance on the tourist economy. Um, and all of those coastal towns up in Western Michigan um, that rely on the lake primarily for the tourist economy between April and November, even, even 12 months of the year now. Um, so an ongoing discussion, um, but with particular emphasis now on the ecology of the region, both understanding um, the region through the lens of ecology but also preserving the landscapes and the environment of the region as we move forward and how that preservation will start to kind of impact new future urbanization processes in Chicago and other locations moving forward. So that's it, I'm gonna leave it there. That was 501. Thank you so much, Claire. Chair, I'm sorry. No, I said thank you so much, Claire. Hopefully we can um, switch back to viewing both of us. Perfect, that's great. So Claire, thank you very much indeed. That was a um, wide ranging, very provocative presentation of an impressive, exciting project. We have um, a couple questions, really interesting questions that have already come in. And I'm gonna, um, if I may, just bundle some of them together and put some questions on the table. Let me also just invite everyone, um, just reminding you the, the way that we're gonna do this is um, write your question in the chat box and I'll keep an eye on them and um, see um, how many questions we can pose to Claire and get into um, a discussion here. Um, and also, I believe there is a little button where if you want to look at the questions that are posed, you can click like on it and that gives me a sense of the level of collective urgency that emerges around some of, of the questions um, that have been posed. So Claire, um, there are a couple questions that have been posed about, um, about the project itself. In other words, the book. It's obviously a very wide ranging book with a lot of different authors, a lot of different perspectives, a massive research project on 100 plus years of capitalist urbanization, its spatial expressions, its ecological dimensions, its consequences, and the possibility of shaping it with a big team of authors. Mm -hmm. So I think a number of us are curious about, first of all, how did you do it? Like, um, so Arthur, um, actually, let me actually first go to Sarah's question. She, she comments, what a stunning sweeping intellectual effort that is both collaborative and interdisciplinary. What was the conception of this project like? What kinds of initial obstacles, if any, did you face in the planning of such an ambitious research effort? I think that's something that a number of us are curious about just in terms of mounting and then actually delivering on such a, a book that's so massive both in scope but also physically. And Arthur raises a question substantively about the research project which um, emerges from that kind of method. In other words, bringing many colleagues from diverse locations and teams together. He says, um, you mentioned that in the layering of perspectives that make up this volume, you surfaced a number of anomalies that the team found revelatory. He loves this notion. He's wondering what were some of the particular revelations, the anomalies that emerged from the research um, as you continue to think about these issues. And if I may, that's already a number of issues, but I'll just tack on, in some ways, a framing issue uh, 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 that connects to both of those questions. So it's clearly a book where, at first cut, it seems clear that you and your co-editors were concerned to document a process, a set of processes, and levels of interdependence that we don't adequately understand by assembling data, maps, documents simply in order to represent, there's a massive representational effort and accomplishment here, this dimension of urbanization in the United States and in the world. And I'm wondering, I mean, this connects a little bit to Arthur's question about the anomalies. If you had to crystallize 
from the documentation. In other words, you've, you've documented your effort of documenting all these processes. But if you had to crystallize the core argument and intervention about the Third Coast and the Great Lakes, what would it be? And I have a suggestion, just a proposal. I don't know if this actually corresponds to your intention, but I was really struck by the way you accentuated Pierre Bélanger's chapter, where he develops an account of urbanization during kind of the modernist period of de design, these heroic large scale interventions, creating the Erie Canal, many other hydrological transformations, big massive industrial infrastructure to facilitate this scale of interdependence and urban development on the one hand. And on the other side, and you definitely concluded with this point as well, the volume also documents the incredible ecological and social destruction connected to that modernist moment of capitalist industrial development. And for me, anyway, that was that's one of the big takeaways. In other words, this massive scale of kind of modern infrastructural, hydrological, technological transformation. And at the same time, the ways in which that created um, long-term uh, decay, destruction, social and ecological injustice and so forth. For me, that's a takeaway. Um, that emerges in a certain way, as it were, organically from the massive documentation. So I wondered if you could reflect on that. That's already a number of issues on the table. Um, we should give Claire a chance to respond. And again, to the, no, to the audience here, feel free to add more questions. Claire, table. sorry. Um, I'm just writing those down. Uh, just um, in going in, in that order, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for your question. Um, uh, yeah, it, 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 it does look like a huge... It was a huge project, a huge endeavor, but we did it over nine years. And so, you know, it would be super busy for six months and then it would go away for a year. And then it would be super busy again for another six months and it would go away. And so it was very piecemeal in terms of its, um, our approach and the time we could dedicate it to. I remember being here in Chicago, we have this event in Chicago called, um, somebody will correct me is it you know one of the it's in November uh, October great city great spaces and you can go to buildings that are not typically open to the public um I don't know what the official name is um and uh, a lot of architects and urbanists will do lectures in in buildings that weekend and I did one on the Chicago beaches and so we got in this shuttle bus and we went up and down Lakeshore Drive to the different beaches and talked about how the beaches were made artificial systems where the, the sand comes in from. And, and that was the kind of impetus for the book. It was like, somebody kind of said, wow, that's a really kind of interesting way to talk about Chicago. You should write a book about this. So that was kind of how the book started. And then we got Danny involved because Danny had written The High Cash, a similar book about Catalonia, Mason became involved. So, we, we never knew what the kind of end product was as we were doing it, but it was like a snowball, Sarah. It just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's where we kind of ended up. And then we got some nice funding. The GSD were very good in terms of providing, you know, sort of um, the, the seminar as a kind of wing for the research and interns to help with the maps. We got a Graham Foundation grant and then a grant from UIC, um, the Vice Chancellor of Research. So a very organic project. Um, Arthur's question, and this leads into Neil's, um, maybe, maybe anomalies might not have been the correct word, but I, I second Neil's sort of comment on revelations. Um, and, and it is just that the kind of public imagination of the mid, you know, the city of broad shoulders, you know, you know, the kind of gritty real world aspect that I think permeates the region, you know, the Rust Belt and, and, and many names of the region. And Pierre talks about this, I won't say derogatory names, but, but titles that were kind of presented the region in a very particular way. Um, and then, but at, at, on the flip side of that, the kind of, um, the fact that the region was one of the first areas that started to notice the impact 
of the industry and the impact of the super urbanization of the region. Um, and so in one way, we started to lead the field in terms of, you know, um, you know, Clean Water Act came out of the discussion of water in the Great Lakes. Um, many of the EPA mandates in the early 1970s, those super fun sites were in the Midwest. Um, and so, you know, this, the kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of a yin yang or the kind of heavy duty side, but also the kind of the, 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 the soft kind of almost, um, um, feminist almost side of, of the region that has actually now and will be the engine that moves the region, you know, onward in the 21st century, you know, and, you know, at, a, at an economic level as much as anything. Um, and so, yeah, so, so I, I think that um, the, the kind of the question is, and I, and the book also, we try to write the book for a broad audience. You know, the idea was that the mayor of every town in the, in the Midwest would have a copy of this book and would be able to, it, the book is like written quite, it's direct. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not oblique in its kind of um, delivery. Um, and so, you know, the idea that it, it could start to kind of encompass um, a kind of, um, uh, not a grassroots, but, but it, that it could sort of start a movement um, in terms of how we look at the region, but also recognize that the future of the region, you know, we need industry, you know, we need economy. I mean, you know, look at what happened many of these cities and still happening. I mean, Cleveland, Detroit, I mean, tough stories, but how do you reinvent that future, that urban future through um, environmental issues and through a more ecological way of thinking about uh, the water, you know, for instance, um, energy. Pierre talks about, you know, wind farms, land banking. There's lots of things going on, urban agriculture in Detroit, like you could profile many of these new kind of urban economy meets urban strategies that are, are, are emerging. So thank you for that, Claire. So there are a number of questions about mapping the third coast region. And the book, as you showed, you know, even from your brief presentation, I think it's clear that the book is, is just a rich assemblage of cartographic materials, both historical cartographic materials and materials that your authors produced and that the editorial team produced in order to try to represent this, this particular region. So I think um, there are a couple things that, um, that, we might, that we might reflect on in that regard. And I'll um, just begin with a question from, um, from Jake who asks about the question of um, the cartographies that are envisioned by sovereign indigenous communities within the region. He wants to know whether that was, um, whether such issues, whether such cartographies and the, um, the kind of life worlds and territorialities of sovereign indigenous communities are part of the analysis and how one might set study the processes of urban transformation documented in the book with um, an eye towards their settler colonial histories? Great question, Jake. Um, you know, maybe you've identified a problem with the book. I would say that the kind of the cartographic bias and, and unintentionally so was toward the more kind of colonial maps because that history is available to us. Um, and there is less emphasis, let's say, on an indigenous mapping of the region, not because that's not important or because I mean, we, didn't, we didn't feel that that's a valuable um, way or lens of reading the region, um, but I, I, I will, 
yeah, I will say it airs um, more on the kind of colonial mapping and understanding um, the history of the region from that way. So there's a project, Jake, um, to sort of a hole in the book that certainly um, would be a kind of great alternative, a, a kind of, yeah, uh, a kind of situationist type mapping of, of the territory. Um, I mean, I will say, is it in Jeff Manaw's text that, you know, again, talking about um, a kind of the history of water, he does start to talk about kind of indigenous communities, sort of, you know, even pre-industrial communities. Um, so that chapter might actually um, be enlightening that way. Um, yeah. So let me, um, let me just ask a few other things about the mapping part of the book. I mean, I really appreciated, Claire, the ways in which at the beginning of the talk, you posed what I think is one of the fundamental questions, unsolvable, but fundamental, namely, how do we bound the city? Where does the city begin and where does it end? And I want to ask you somewhat directly, like, how do you, what is your position on that? And let me just say a little, let, let me motivate it a little more. So in um, one of my classes this term with my students in an introduction to urban social science course, we read a number of texts on megalopolis, which of course you and your authors engage with in this book, including the famous Doxiotis essay on the Great Lakes megalopolis. And one of the things that we discussed in relation to that classic literature, Doxiotis, Gottman, and others, is that it seems a little arbitrary. In other words, on the one side, it's quite convincing to read Gottman on Megalopolis, Boswash, and the many other Megalopoli he documents, and then to read Doxiotis, who has such an elaborate documentation of the many scales of ecological, infrastructural, social, demographic, et cetera, interdependence. And then you can create a map, you can draw lines, you can scale it up. And I'm certainly sympathetic to the idea that we have to scale it up given the, the kind of colossal nature of contemporary urbanization. So that's all on the one side. But on the other, other side, it seems a little bit arbitrary because you could keep, you could keep scaling it out. Mm -hmm. You could scale it further out beyond the, the third coast and beyond Gottman's boss wash. You could start to connect the different megalopoli. And at some point you're looking at the scale of um, a very unevenly developed fabric of we might say planetary urbanization, we might say, we might come up with a different term, but clearly there are folds and contours and uneven differentiations within this, um, within this kind of uh, tapestry or mosaic. So, so basically, where do you come down on this? I mean, clearly there's a specificity to the third coast, which is in part defined, one might argue, by the interplay between inherited historical ecologies of water and land use and urbanization processes. But the books, you know, the book makes a strong claim that, that there is something coherent, not just as an imagined realm, but as a space of design, as a space of action, and as a space of interdependence that you call the third coast. So where so how do you how do you demarcate that? and um, relative to both the smaller scales that one might also argue are fundamental and potentially larger scales. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, the best book maybe, what is the best book about a city is actually a book about Chicago is Bill Cronin's Nature's right. Metropolis. And it's actually a kind of similar shtick in so far as there is, you cannot think of one without the other. Um, and there's this really comp both fundamental in one hand and then complex on the other relationship between the city and, and to use his word, the hinterland. And so this kind of, the, the continued oscillation about inside and outside or interior, exterior, um, whether that's the prairie landscape or the lakes. Um, I think that's kind of a fascinating discussion. I mean, um, yeah, there's no kind of real um, sort of, um, there's no conclusion to that discussion, but for the longest time I felt in architecture, 
and notwithstanding the megapolis kind of research and Doxiotis's work in the kind of, um, when was that, 50s, 60s, um, the kind of urban design or the architecture community, I don't think saw cities in that as a dialogue between outside and inside. Um, and that to, to the kind of detriment, I think, of urban design and planning in the US in general, and I still see it today in, in architecture schools where we do an urban project and it's urban, I'm in the loop in my office, urban is downtown in the loop and it's a bounded condition and it has edges and it has boundaries. Um, and I think we have simplified, and I, and I say this sort of, you know, a little bit of criticism to my own discipline, we've kind of simplified the complexities of what even to frame the urban project. And I suppose without coming to any conclusion, the book tries to blow that up or, or maybe rec somebody would say, reclaim Cronin's thesis is that the, the framing is a constant oscillation between outside and inside. Um, and I, I, I think that's, and, and I think that that's, um, that way of thinking you know, maybe was recuperated in the kind of 1990s and in the 2000s through the kind of landscape urbanism project, both at the GSD and many other institutions. And then maybe through more, I'm thinking of Christian Schmidt and your work, um, um, Lefebvre that started to kind of think about urbanism, not through the perspective of the architectural object, but frame it as a systemic project. Um, and I think there's a lot of people, like I think that much of the design research in the book, if you look at Kathy and Jeff's work, if you look at, um, uh, you know, Rania and Al Hadi or Mason and Lola, there is a kind of cohort of thinkers, oddly enough in the Midwest that have a bias towards that sensibility to thinking about urban design. Um, and that project is inherently more of an interdisciplinary one because, you know, it, it, it's, ecological systems, infrastructural systems, transport systems, economic systems. Um, but it, but it's, it's also that, that way of thinking about the city is, is very difficult at times to kind of get a handle on all the different kind of bits and pieces. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, the, the kind of end of the book, and, and, and this was kind of Charles's thesis too, that, uh, you know, nobody designs cities anymore. You know, architects used to design cities, landscape architects design cities, like if you look at Olmsted design big urban areas. Um, and then planners started sort of designing cities, but planners is, is a much more abstract way of thinking about space. You know, it's through numbers and through policy and through, you know, uh, rules. Um, and so the idea is that nobody nobody is designing the city. And when I say the city, I mean that as, as an idea as much as as a place. And so how do we, how do we kind of get our heads around that? And how, how can we make a book that starts to talk to that topic? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really important. And I just want to really underscore this for students and also for colleagues in the room who may not be that familiar with the kind of worlds of architecture and urban design discursively. So I really want to underscore that the work of Claire and her colleagues, I, from my point of view, it's a very strong critique of architectural and urbanistic discourse in kind of mainstream circles that tends to bound the site because a client, usually because a client owns or has some kind of jurisdictional power over a particular plot of land and that becomes the project. It's defined by property, by, by, by the boundaries of, of property. And then it's all about situating the site in a broader context. But the scale of design is basically, ta it's taken for granted that it's bounded. And the work that Claire, her colleagues, both in this book and elsewhere have been doing, really unsettles that. Because even though, of course, there are particular sites and scales of intervention, such as the wonderful projects that you shared for, with us at the end on the Erie Canal. Mm. I particularly like the fire one since I'm usually cold in the winter. I want the sauna and the hot chocolate and the, um, the hot tub rather than the, the, the ice and the snow. But in other words, 
There are particular sites of design intervention, but they're understood as part of a totality, a whole, an ensemble. There are different terms in assemblage, but a multi-scalar realm of interdependence. So just again, for everyone in the room who may not be familiar with these worlds, this is a dissident discourse and practice, which from my point of view, we urgently need both as a research method and as a, as a mode of intervention in relation to these challenges. Because of course the challenges are not bounded. We're not gonna solve climate change by building a net zero building. Mm -hmm. That might help, but ultimately the building is not the right scale. The scale is probably much closer to the scale on which the Third Coast Atlas is framed. So I see that we really just have a few minutes left. And there are a number of questions that have been posed. I'm not gonna be able to get into all of them, but a number of um, participants are very interested in the practical implications of your work, Claire, of this book and elsewhere related to, um, for example, Robert poses the question about how your approach might help inform our critical perspective on contemporary local projects, such as the Obama Library here in the neighborhood of Hyde Park. And Chris also asks a very interesting question along these lines. He mentions that in some of your personal design work and in your comments about femi a feminist voice for the region, you've suggested the need for a new narrative at a regional scale, less the city of broad shoulders in that kind of traditional modernist sense than something else. And this series that we're participating in is of course a series about futures. So we're wondering, and I'm sure Chris's question speaks for a question that many of us have, what kind of futures do you think the volume can potentially anticipate and even um, contribute to for Chicago and for, for the broader um, region? So the prelude to the plan, we all wanna know, okay, give us the plan. And probably you have a different conception of the plan than the one you just alluded to that mainstream urban planners endorse. Yeah. Of course, that's a big question, but any thoughts you can share with us in these remaining moments well, will be I, I um, think welcome. That, yeah, I think that the, the one thing you, there is no plan. I mean, the, the plan is there's no plan. What I mean by that is there's no hegemonic kind of, you know, this is what we're going to do plan. Um, it's a series of multiple plans that responds to, um, you know, the externalities of, of a particular node. So, for example, you know, at the scale in, in Chicago, you know, I, I think, um, you know, dealing with, you know, all the work recently on the riverfront. I mean, again, some students have moved here maybe in the last couple of years. And, and think that's kind of been the norm, but actually the opening up of the river is like a huge development in the city and very recent. And so for me, my work is more related to infrastructure quite literally. And so it's, you know, I fundamentally believe infrastructure is the catalyst for city making. Um, and, and, and infrastructure is also a public and or should be public and democratic space. Um, and so the, the future, um, is in, in, in systems and infrastructure and networks and how that brings equity and how that brings equality and access to everyone that lives here. Um, in other areas, I mean, it's kind of interesting, one could be quite radical in thinking about the future in so far as we have a resource that very few places in the whole world have. And this would be maybe Martin and Sarah's projects from a few years ago, you know, that if there are emergencies related, ecological emergencies, um, you know, maybe people shouldn't be living in the Southwest anymore because there's no water. Um, we could actually see vast increases in population because of the, the freshwater resource. And what would that mean for the urbanization of the Great Lakes? I mean, cause it's not dense. Okay, like downtown Chicago is dense, but for the most part, it's planetary. It's thin, light, it's, it's Lefebvre's mesh, isn't it? Um, and it's got holes and pockets every now and then. But I'm remembering that image in the third or fourth slide that really shows that sprinkling of white on the southern parts of the lakes, like all the way from Milwaukee to Chicago through Cleveland to Rochester. I mean, that's just, it, it's urban, it's completely urban. Um, and, you know, what, what would happen that that area 
um, if there was kind of major surges in population, how would you deal with that um, moving forward? So there, there, there's, there's kind of like the kind of acupuncture way of thinking about the region, but there's also, um, you know, and particularly after the year we've had, um, that one should not leave the kind of radical project off the table for too long. Uh, because it can change drastically in a very short period of time. Um, yeah, but I mean, many of these cities too, you know, um, you know, the kind of inner city versus the metropolitan city, there's a lot of inequalities, um, you know, whether it's Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, that fundamentally has to be considered. Um, in a way that has not been considered. And maybe by framing that not specific to any one urban location, but framing that across the region might actually um, catalyze um, something. Or, you know, the last thing which was on the table and now off the table again was the high speed. Um, you know, we did have pretty dismal transportation in the region. Um, and, you know, would high speed would actually work very well, given that all these cities are kind of two, two and a half hours from each other, um, uh, making rail intersections and rail um, infrastructure could actually work in this region in the way it doesn't work in other um, parts of the continent. Um, so maybe, yeah, like, you know, you work in Cleveland and you live in, you know, I don't know, Grand Rapids, or you work in Cleveland and you work in South Bend. Um, I think greater porosity between the urban areas moving forward is also something to think about um, in the future. So thank you, Claire. So Chris has given me permission to ask one more question and this is a, a really tough one. There's no answer to it, but I think it would be great to hear your thoughts on it. And um, so I'll just share. So during the many years I taught at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard as a social scientist working with designers, I constantly made the argument, constantly, like from the day I got there till the day I left, that we need to think about design not only in terms of physical infrastructural design, but the design of institutions. In other words, the, re the, the redesign of the things that we care about in the world, let's say, you know, ecological systems to be more sustainable, it requires not only new infrastructures of buildings and cities and territories, but institutions. And I just want to ask you, Claire, like, where does the book leave us on the question of institutional redesign? Because as you well know, there are massive barriers to cooperation or even representation at the scales that you've so and your colleagues have so productively drawn our attention to. So much of land use, so much of investment, so much of planning in the United States and to some degree in Canada as well is local or of course state level and provincial. And even if we had the relevant states and provinces within the third coast committed to a kind of systematic planning of interdependence within the region in order to address social and ecological justices, injustices, excuse me, those scales are arguably still too small. And furthermore, to make it even messier, many of the issues in question are dealt with through an incredibly fragmented system of intervention. So water, energy, transport, public health, economic development, and so forth. They're, they're often separated from one another that prevent governmental agencies and social movements to some degree as well um, from addressing the holistic interdependencies that we really need to deal with in order to address the great problems of our time. So to some degree, that very question, you can probably hear in the subtext, it's an argument to um, reinvent big government. It's a very dissident kind of thing to say in the contemporary moment where small, you know, lean and mean governments tend to be, um, tend to have a lot of appeal in the current ideological climate. So what do you think about that? And to what degree can this research and um, perspective help us think about those questions of institutional redesign um, in a different way, given the urgency 
of the kinds of questions and that you're posing and the kinds of processes that you're investigating. And this will be this will be basically also your opportunity just to give us any final comments because okay. I do believe um, we have to wrap up after yeah. this question. No, I mean I I, I mean I think um, it's less an institutional umbrella for me. It's more a collective. I mean, you know, we live in a kind of, um, you know, I was writing an essay there and, and somebody said, well, what are the collective values of design today? And I'm sitting there going, well, um, you know, that was the modernist project. I mean, setting the ideology, you know, which was a kind of different mission, but at least there was, at least in the discipline, something that everyone got behind. And so for me, it's less institutional collectivity and more a, a collective in the discipline. And I think the environmental project could become the collective project. And so it reminds me of Hashem's new book, which I was reading, which talks about the world. It's going beyond a kind of continental big idea, but, but the world as an architecture project and the fact that um, we have to, the, we're at the point, what was this the, I mean, I don't want to be the kind of the bearer of bad news or, but what's the cliff, you know, where the two degrees temperatures and it's just all going to collapse. It's not about your neighborhood or your town or your state anymore. It's about something much bigger called in his like earth or the planet. And so for me, when I read that, I was like, God, that's kind of interesting. Whether, I mean, you know, maybe it's a little scare tactic, um, but it would be really interesting if we could just kind of step out of our own zones and, and start to think about a bigger idea about humanity or a bigger idea about the world we live in. Um, and I think that maybe the crisis, the impending crisis that we have now, you know, the, that might be an opportunity to do that. Um, and whether that exists at political level, I think, yes, it has to exist at political level. It exists at institutional level. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it exists in every one of us. I mean, we are you know, we, we, we have the power if we work collectively to exercise it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, and that builds down, doesn't it? Like to how you put your kind of recycling or, or and, and Chicago is not necessarily the kind of greenest or the most, what should I say, PC city when it comes to, um, you know, measures, environmental measures. Um, but I think that the, the collective imagination is on our side and, and that's where the power ultimately lies. And then the kind of political ideologies and the institutional ideologies and the disciplinary ideologies will then follow. So, so I'm very hopeful. Um, and I think the last year might have actually moved that on a little bit. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think we just have to get behind things together um, more. And so I liked how Hashem, you know, um, presents that idea as a disciplinary project, you know, which is kind of ultimately what I can comment on. Um, I, I think that's, and, and then that book looks at a kind of history of projects some are a little so-so in terms of their ideology, but at least tries to frame that um, within architecture, urbanism, planning. Yeah. Exactly. And just in case anyone didn't get the reference to the book Claire is referring to, it's a new book by Hashem Sarkis of MIT called The World as Architectural Project. So Claire, thank you very much. And I'll now turn it back over to my colleague, Chris, who will say some concluding words. And very, very few thanks first to everyone who joined us this evening, um, faculty, colleagues, students, staff. I saw a wide range in our audience. A particular thanks both to, uh, to Neil for convening this conversation and to Claire for giving her time tonight and being with us, sharing not only her work, but also a, a really expansive vision 
um, that I, in particular, am really grateful to have at this point in our series as we reach the midpoint of our consideration of Chicago futures, but thinking uh, at the end, even globally. Um, I would recommend folks uh, seek out Third Coat Atlas and buy it. Uh, as Neil said, that's a bit of a project these days because it's sold out all over the place. Um, however, if we find any stash of them, do pursue them, and we encourage you to do so in particular at your local and independent bookstores, wherever you may be shopping. Um, references to uh, a number of different works and authors were made throughout the course of this presentation. We'll publish the video of this session, as well as links to as many of those as we're able to track down on the Chicago Studies website, where we also post this session's recording. We'll make that available as soon as we can, but it usually takes us a few days to do video processing and then the associated research. Um, but that we hope will give everyone an opportunity to learn a little bit more. Um, one of these scholars, of course, is a member of our faculty here at the University of Chicago. Neil, I don't remember if you're teaching anything in the spring, but if you are, this would be a great time to mention. Look for me next year, everyone. Um, I, I have a full slate of classes next year on topics very much related to um, the, the evening's agenda. All right, fantastic. I know that we're also fortunate to invite Claire to, uh, to be part of various classes, especially through the Chicago Studies program uh, over the course of the year. I've seen her name across my desk a few times before this one. And so I'm particularly Thanks. grateful for whenever, whenever you um, your expertise. On behalf of the College of the University of Chicago, Chicago Studies, the Parasia Program for Public Discourse, again, thanks to everyone for participating in this evening's presentation. As I mentioned, the recording of this evening's session will be available on the Chicago Studies website later this week, Chicago Studies, uchicago.edu slash futures. Uh, we'll also post additional information about Third Coast Atlas Prelude to a plan there. Although we are at the end of our winter quarter, our discussion of Chicago's future has just begun. During spring break, we encourage you Chicago students to consider participating in our Chicago 2050 Design Challenge, which is registering teams for the opportunity to catalyze conversation about issues that they think matter most to our city and our region in the next 30 years. And our first futures event of the spring quarter will take place on Wednesday of week one, that will be the next of our distinguished lectures presented on March 31st by UChicago Professor of Urbanism, Emily Talon on the post-COVID city or how great Chicago would be if urban planners would just take all the pandemic's lessons seriously. Our subsequent spring lectures will address Chicago's rediscovery of its agricultural potential through urban food production, the dire implications of a year of remote learning for equity in our public schools and the implications of data-driven policymaking for our city's future. All of these promise to be fascinating conversations, and we very much hope that you will join us for as many as you are able. Until then, be well. Thank you all once again, and have a good night.